the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> John Kiriakou worked for the CIA. He, um, he was uh, instrumental uh, in the capture in Pakistan in 2002 of Abu Zabida. How'd I do? Zabida. Zabida, sorry. Doing my best here. Um, who they believed to be the third ranking official on Al Qaeda at the time. There was lots of twos and threes back then, remember them. In uh, 2007, however, Kiriakou blew the whistle on the CIA's torture program, telling ABC News that the CIA tortured prisoners, that torture was official U.S. government policy, and that the policy had been approved by then President George W. Bush. He became the sixth whistleblower indicted by the Obama administration under the Espionage Act, a law designed to punish spies. He served 23 months in prison as a result of this revelation. He's a hero. It's not every day you come to a political event and have a uh, ex-convict introducing an ex-convict. John Kerry, up your place. Thank you, everybody. Thank you um, for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here because I've found a home uh, in the Libertarian Party. <laughs> And I know not everybody here is an actual member of the Libertarian Party, but you know, it's, you pay $25, they put your name on the list and you can call yourself a member. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. Christine, thank you especially. I'd like to talk to you tonight about uh, an odyssey that I've had over the last few years with our, uh, our federal government. The theme of the story being that Ronald Reagan was right, that government is the problem. It's not the solution to the problem. I came to that conclusion the hard way. I spent uh, 15 years in the CIA, the first half of my career in analysis on the Middle East, and the second half of my career in counterterrorism operations. Um, I was proud of my work. I loved every minute that I spent at the CIA. Um, unfortunately, I was the subject of two assassination attempts overseas, but uh, that just made me want even more to serve my country. Why? Because I believed then that, uh, that we're the good guys, right? We're supposed to be out overseas protecting Americans, uh, disrupting attacks, and making sure that we're all safe, right? For our own liberty. But I came to learn that we really don't have much in the way of liberty, at least not since September 11. I'll get to that in a moment. In 2002, and I'm going to make a very long story short, in 2002, I was, uh, I was sent to Pakistan as the uh, chief of CIA counterterrorism operations there. I had been in country for only about two weeks when we got word from CIA headquarters that Abu Zubaydah was somewhere in Pakistan and we had to catch him. Abu Zubaydah, we believed at the time, was the number three in Al-Qaeda. In fact, that wasn't true, although he was a very bad man. He was Al-Qaeda's logistician. He was in charge of Al-Qaeda's training camps. He had set up a safe house in Peshawar, Pakistan, called the House of Martyrs, where new uh, jihadis were, were kept uh, before they were sent on to Afghanistan for training. So this was a bad guy. If you were a jihadi and, and you needed a false passport, or a ticket home, or a safe house, or money, Abu Zubaydah was the man that you went to see. He was certainly in contact with, with all of the 9-11 hijackers and helped to, uh, to finance their, their terrorism. So we had to catch him. The problem is that Pakistan is the size of Texas and it has 230 million people. So you get orders to catch him and what do you do? You can stand on the street corner and just look for somebody who you know, looks to be an Arab. It doesn't work. <laughs> so I came up with a couple of really bad ideas. Uh, nothing worked. We ended up flying in an analyst, a, a specialty analyst called a targeteer, targeting analyst, and he was able to pour through thousands and thousands of pages of documents, and he was able to narrow down Abu Zubaydah's possible location to 14 sites. Again, I'm going to make a very long story short and say that we decided to hit all 14 sites simultaneously, one night in March of 2002. And sure enough, Abu Zubaydah was, was in one of the sites. Now, he um, tried to escape. And so he climbed to the roof of his safe house and jumped to the roof of the next door house 
in order to climb down and, and run away. He and, and two cohorts did this. One was his bodyguard, one was a Syrian bomb maker. Now there was a Pakistani policeman standing on the ground in between the two buildings, and he, as each man jumped, he shot them. And uh, the Syrian bomb maker, he killed instantly. Abu Zubaydah was shot in the thigh, the groin, and the stomach with an AK-47. And the bodyguard was shot right through the center of his femur. He ended up losing the leg. I heard these shots from a nearby safe house where I was holed up waiting for, for all 14 teams to, to let me know how things were going, who they were catching. We ended up catching, I'm not allowed to say the actual number, but it's, it's more than four dozen Al-Qaeda fighters in, in that one night. It still stands today as the, as the largest CIA counterterrorism capture operation ever in the CIA's history. Abu Zubaydah was, uh, as I said, severely wounded. And so I rushed to the, to the scene where he had been shot and I looked around and I said to the Pakistani major on site, where is he? He said, he's here on the ground. We only had a six-year-old passport photo of Abu Zubaydah, so we really, we thought we knew what he looked like, we really didn't. This passport photo was, a, was of a, a young man, thin, handsome, cro closely cropped beard and mustache. This guy on the ground was fat, clean shaven, crazy Albert Einstein hair going all over the place. And I said, this doesn't look anything like him. I didn't know what to do, so I called the office in Islamabad and I said to the analyst, we have somebody here, but it, this doesn't look like him at all. He said, give me a picture of his eye. We'll do a retinal scan. So I leaned down over him and I said, if the hayunek, open your eyes. And he was dying. His eyes were rolled back in his head. And I said to the analyst, I think he's, he's almost dead. He can't open his eyes. And when I open them, it's just the whites. So he said, take a picture of his ear. Now, I didn't know until that night that no two people on earth have the same ears. They're like fingerprints. So I took a picture of his ear, plugged it into my phone, because in those days, in the ancient times of 2002, cameras weren't in phones yet. And I sent it to Islamabad. The analyst sent it to headquarters. Headquarters called back and said, it's him. So we threw him into the back of this filthy Toyota pickup truck. By now it's about 3.15 a.m. And we rushed him to the most horrible place on earth, Faisalabad Hospital in Faisalabad, Pakistan. Windows and doors are open. Dogs and cats are walking up and down the halls. Swarms of mosquitoes are just feeding on people's open wounds. One thing that struck me, and I say this in my book, there was a bar of Irish Spring soap, and it had about a dozen syringes sticking out of it. And if you needed a shot, they would take one of the syringes out, put medicine in it, give you the shot, and then stick it back in the bar of soap. And that was as clean as it was going to get. Yeah. So we barged in. Half a dozen Americans dressed as Pakistanis and an Arab who's bleeding to death. And I told the doctor, you've got to patch this guy up. Our orders were to take him alive, I said. The doctor just kind of stood there and looked at me. So I told him, start sewing. So anyway, they took him into, uh, into surgery. But word had gotten around the Al-Qaeda community. Obviously, we hadn't caught all of them. Word had gotten around that, that we had him. And so Al-Qaeda fighters began driving by the hospital and just opening fire on it. And I said to one of the Pakistanis, if they realize we're unarmed, we're dead. Can you get a helicopter in here? And he said he could. 15, 20 minutes later, a helicopter landed in the parking lot. And um, I just barged into the operating room and I told the doctor, let's wrap it up, we have to go. And so he <coughs> sewed him closed as quickly as he could. We wheeled him onto a helicopter and we flew to a nearby Pakistani military base. Abu Zubaydah was in a coma for the next 24 hours. And in the meantime, my orders, which had come from George Tennant, who was the director at the time, my orders were 24-7 CIA eyes on, he said. Do not leave his side. I was 
exhausted. I had been up something like 28 hours already and I was afraid I would fall asleep so I took a sheet and I tore it up and I tied him to the bed. Even though he was comatose, I was afraid, I don't know, maybe the doctor is an Al-Qaeda sympathizer, he's going to break him out while I'm sleeping, or the nurse, or I, I didn't know what to expect. After about 24 hours, um, he opened his eyes and um, it's kind of a funny story. It wasn't funny at the time. It was pathetic at the time. It's funny in retrospect. Uh, I was very uh, dirty, and I called a colleague of mine uh, who was at the safe house, and I said, hey, listen, can you do me a favor? I smell really bad, and I haven't had a shower in days, but I've got a clean pair of underwear and a T-shirt that I sleep in at the safe house. Can you bring it to me? He said, sure. So he brought my underwear and a pair of socks and a... And this t-shirt, it's a t-shirt that was a gift from my children. I sleep in it, uh, but it's a red t-shirt with SpongeBob SquarePants in the middle. <laughs> and so I got changed and I was sitting at the foot of his bed and he finally started to stir. And he opened one eye and you could tell the exact instant that he realized, oh my God, the Americans have me. Because he looked at SpongeBob. <laughs> And his heart rate went from 120 to 220. And then the machine started going beep, 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 beep. And then you hear code blue, code blue, bay one. And then they come in with a crash card and they shock him and they give him Demerol and then he's out again. So a couple of hours later, he woke up again. And as I said, he was tied to the bed. So he motioned for me like this to, to come over. And I. I moved his oxygen mask and I said, uh, Shuismek, what is your name? And he shook his head. So I repeated it, Shuismek. And he said to me in beautiful English, he said, I will not speak to you in God's language. And I said, that's okay, Abu Zubaydah, we know who you are. And, um, and he started crying and he said, kill me, brother. Take the pillow and kill me. And I said, no, nobody's going to kill you. I said, we've been looking for you for a long time. In fact, if I make you one promise, it's that you're going to get the best medical care that the American government can provide. And indeed, he did. Uh, the, the executive director of the CIA at the time um, also sat on the board of directors of Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. And so he asked the chief of trauma surgery to fly out on a CIA jet and, um, and nurse up with beta back to health. So uh, he was very upset. He would sort of go out of it and then wake up again and he said he would never know the touch of a woman. He would never know the joy of fatherhood. I said, listen, you're not the victim here. There were 50,000 people in those towers. What did you think was going to happen? Did you think that we wouldn't come after you? Did you think that we wouldn't try to kill you and Bin Laden and everybody else and everybody who reminded us of you and Bin Laden? I said, there are 3,000 people whose souls are on your head. So don't tell me you're never going to know the touch of a woman and you're never going to know the joy of fatherhood. You did this on purpose. He said he didn't want to attack the United States on September 11th. He wanted to attack Israel. He said he just wanted to kill Jews. And I said, well, there's nothing I can do about that. I said, you've committed a crime. You're going to have to pay a price for it. And then as the days passed, it was another day and a half or so, um, he wanted to talk about the differences between Christianity and Islam. I have a degree in Islamic theology of all things. Uh, he, wanted to, uh, he wanted to recite poetry. He would write really bad poetry and, and <laughs> tell me his poems. And then at the end of it, uh, the jet landed from, uh, from Baltimore and um, I told him, we're going to wheel you out and put you on a jet. He was very frightened. He asked me to hold his hand, as a matter of fact. Three FBI agents and I carried him out on the gurney, and I held his hand. We, we went onto the plane. We had to stand him up in the gurney and maneuver him to get onto the plane, and then we laid him across the back uh, luggage rack and, and tied him to the luggage rack. And he took off, and I never saw him again. Two months later, I returned to headquarters from Pakistan. And uh, I was in the cafeteria one day. I had been home, I guess, about a week or a week and a half. And I was in the cafeteria, and a senior officer in the CIA's counterterrorism center approached me, and he said, hey, I'm glad I ran into you. 
do you want to be certified in the use of enhanced interrogation techniques? Those were his exact words. I had never heard the term before. I said, what's that mean? And very excitedly, he said, we're going to start getting rough with these guys. I said, well, what's that mean? And he outlined to me these 10 different techniques that um, were in the process of presidential approval. And I said, that sounds like a torture program. And I said, but you know what? Let me think about it for an hour. So I went upstairs to the seventh floor of the CIA, the executive floor. I had a, uh, I, I won't call him a friend, but there was a man for whom I had worked a decade earlier in the Middle East who was in an extraordinarily senior position in the CIA by then. And I, I went in and I said, hey, let me ask you a question. They just asked me if I wanted to be certified in the use of these enhanced interrogation techniques. What do you think of this? And he said, first, Let's call it what it is. It's a torture program. They can use whatever euphemism they want, but it's a torture program. And he said, second, torture is a slippery slope. And you know how some of these guys are. Somebody's going to go overboard, and they're going to kill a prisoner. And when that happens, there's going to be a congressional investigation. And then there's going to be a Justice Department investigation. And then somebody's going to go to prison. Do you want to go to prison? I said, no, I don't want to go to prison. I'm the only one who went to prison at the end of the day. <laughs> I said, no, no, I don't want to go to prison. I went back downstairs, I said, this is a torture program, I don't want anything to do with it. They had approached 14 people, two of us had said no, and one of the two changed his mind and said yes. So I was the only person who said no. Because I said no, I was cut out of the compartment, meaning that I was not uh, allowed to see any of the reporting cables coming back and forth between headquarters and the secret site uh, where Abu Zubaydah had been sent. But then I got promoted because of the Abu Zubaydah capture, right? And I became executive assistant to the deputy director of the CIA. And in that capacity, I had access to what I thought was all reporting traffic. What happened was, on August 1st, 2002, the day that President Bush signed the executive order allowing for this program to be implemented, two contract psych psychologists uh, Mitchell and Jessen began torturing Abu Zubaydah. Now, in the, in the beginning, a lot was made of, of some of the, I'm going to call them introductory techniques that were used against him. Uh, one was called the, uh, the belly slap, right? You smack somebody in the belly, it makes kind of a cracking sound, it's humiliating. That's not torture. It's humiliating, but I mean, many of us got worse than that at home when we were little kids. Um, but, but that's not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about, to me, it comes down to three different techniques. Waterboarding has gotten almost all of the press. For those of you who don't know what waterboarding is, a person is strapped down to a board or to a gurney with his uh, feet slightly elevated. Some sort of material, it could be burlap, a cloth, even, even uh, cellophane, is wrapped around the head at the mouth to cover the mouth, and then water is poured on the person's face. It, it gives you the sense of, of drowning. And in addition to being very uh, psychologically uh, difficult, stressful, uh, because you are actually taking in a little bit of water, it makes you clench your abdominal muscles. And so the, the real pain comes uh, a day later. Most people don't last more than 20 or 30 seconds on the waterboard. But there were other techniques that were used that were worse. One was sleep deprivation. The Secretary of Defense at the time, uh, Don Rumsfeld, famously said that he didn't believe that there was such a thing as sleep deprivation as a punishment. He said that he had a stand-up desk, he didn't even have a chair in his office, and he would work for two or three days straight. That wasn't really true. I'm sure he believed that he was working for two or three days straight and never sat down. But we're not talking about two or three days. We know from, uh, from the Senate torture report and, and from independent psychologists and psychiatrists that people begin losing their minds at day nine. We know that people begin dying at day 12. But the CIA was authorized to keep prisoners awake for 14 days. 14 days. And I don't mean somebody just comes in and shakes you to make sure you're not sleeping. I mean you are chained to an eye bolt in the ceiling with lights on 24 hours a day and hard rock music being blasted into your cell. You're not going to sleep. And like I say, 
you start going crazy at day nine. We killed somebody using that technique. Another one that I thought was worse than waterboarding was called the cold cell, where the prisoner was stripped naked, chained to that same eye bolt in the ceiling. The cell was chilled to 50 degrees, and then every hour a CIA officer would go into the cell and throw a bucket of ice water on it. We killed another prisoner with that technique too. So I'm seeing this reporting coming in, and I'm thinking, this is not what I signed up for. I signed up to defend my country. One of, the, one of the criticisms that I've faced over the years since I went public with this was that I had promised a not to reveal classified information. That is not true. I took an oath to uphold and to defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, domestic and foreign. And I took that oath very, very seriously. One of the reasons why I objected and really my objection, I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you, my objection came later. I kept my mouth shut for a long time. I kept my mouth shut for almost five years. But one of the reasons why this was so upsetting to me was that we weren't getting anything out of it. You know, Mitchell and Jessen kept reporting from the field that they were gathering actionable intelligence that allowed them to disrupt attacks and that was saving American lives. What information? I mean, I had access to everything. I'm not seeing any information coming from these people. All I see is a reporting cable saying, I was a beta, I was waterboarded again this morning. I should add, he was waterboarded 83 times. Okay, not once or twice, 83 times. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, as bad a guy as Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he's the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, was waterboarded 147 times. And, and gave us almost nothing. So we get these cables that we waterboarded him, you know, six times this morning, and first he cried, and then he vomited, and then he had a seizure and passed out. Okay, first of all, that's torture. Second of all, so what did we get out of it? It doesn't work. It didn't help us gather anything. Now, we, all, we know all this now because of the Senate torture report and because of the release of the CIA Inspector General's report on the program. The program was flawed from the very beginning. But again, I kept my mouth shut. I left the CIA in 2004, and I went to work in the private sector. In 2007, December of 2007, I got a call from Brian Ross at ABC News. And he said that he had a source who said that I had tortured Abu Zubaydah. I said, that was absolutely untrue. I was the only person who was kind to Abu Zubaydah. I said, I have never laid a hand on Abu Zubaydah or on any other prisoner. And God knows, I had the opportunity to lay my hands on a lot of people. And he said, old reporter's trick, which I didn't know at the time, because I didn't know anything about journalism. He said, well, you're welcome to come on the show and defend yourself. <laughs> I said, I'll think about it. Later that week, President Bush gave a press conference in which he looked directly into the camera and he said, we do not torture. Well, my wife was also a CIA officer. And she and I looked at each other and I said, he is a bald-faced liar. But again, it's not up to me, up to John Kiriakou to go tell people that the president's a liar. I waited a couple of days to do that. <laughs> a couple of days later, in response to a reporter's question, he said, we don't torture, but if there is torture, it's the result of a rogue CIA officer. And I said to my wife, Brian Ross's source is at the White House, and they're gonna try to pin this on me. So I called Brian Ross, and I said, I'll come on your show. And I decided that no matter what he asked me, I was gonna tell the truth. So I went on his show in the middle of December 2007, and I said three things. I said that the CIA was torturing its prisoners. I said that torture was official US government policy. It was not the result of a rogue. And I said that the torture program had been personally approved by and signed by the president himself. Within 24 hours, the FBI began a, a criminal investigation of me. And they investigated me for 13 months until January of 2009, and they closed the case. 
They said that I had not committed a crime. Human Rights Watch had said in 2006 that we were torturing our prisoners. Nobody paid any attention. Uh, the ACLU said it in 2007. Amnesty International and the Red Cross said it in 2007. So the FBI said the information's out there. He didn't commit a crime. They closed the case. And then Barack Obama, the most transparent president in history, <laughs> is inoculated. And he immediately ordered that the case be reopened. I didn't know it had been reopened. The FBI investigated me for four more years. Now, I should have been tipped off because the, IR, the IRS began uh, auditing my taxes every year since 2007. Still. But I was oblivious. By that time, I was working on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as the uh, chief investigator. And uh, I got a call from a, from a reporter, and he wanted to have lunch with me. Um, I tried to stay away from reporters, as you might imagine. And so I just deleted the email. But this guy was persistent. And so finally I said to my boss, this guy keeps asking me to go to lunch. He must have a message for me or something. He's been very persistent. My boss said, go ahead and... Uh, Go ahead and uh, accept the lunch. He said, I'll, I'll cover you. So I went to lunch, and uh, delightful lunch. Talked about, you know, events in the Middle East and the Arab Spring and whatever. And at the end, I said, wow, this was really a, de a delightful lunch. Thanks very much for inviting me. And I stood up. And he said, no, 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 that's not why I invited you. You're under surveillance. I said, by whom? He said, the FBI. I, my heart began racing. I said, why? They think you're the source for the John Adams Project. I said, what's the John Adams Project? <laughs> it's this ACLU uh, thing, they're defending the terrorists. And I said, oh my god, you scared me for a second. I said, I never heard of the John Adams Project. I've never met anybody from the ACLU, and the last people on earth I would want to defend are the terrorists. I said, my goodness, I kind of laughed, I walked out. In the meantime, part of my job was to have lunch with uh, foreign uh, diplomats, right? Two, three, four times a week. You just trade information. What's your government's position on this? What's my government's position on that? What do you think of the Turkish elections? What do you think the Israelis are going to do in Gaza? That kind of thing. And then you write a little memo. You send it to the members of the Foreign Relations Committee. So I get invited to lunch by... Um, by the number three in the Japanese embassy. And uh, we go to lunch, completely pro forma lunch, and finally he says to me, so what's next for you? And I said, well, actually, I think I might resign from the committee. I promised Senator Kerry I'd give him two years. It's been two and a half, I'm ready to move on. And he says, no, 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 don't do that. If you give me information, I can give you money. <laughs> and I said, you know how many times I've made that pitch. I said, shame on you. What's the matter with you cold pitching me like that? I'm gonna have to report this to the Senate uh, security officer. What are you thinking? So I thank him for lunch, I go back to, I went directly, as a matter of fact, to the office of the Senate security officer. I said, I was just pitched by a foreign intelligence officer. He said, is it that damn Russian again? I said, no, it's Japanese of all things. <laughs> Japanese. He said, well, yeah, the Japanese, sometimes they, they want to know what we're doing uh, uh, with regard to trade. I said, I don't know. He said, I'm going to call the FBI. So he calls the FBI, and then he called me, and he said, um, the FBI is going to send uh, two guys up to come and talk to you. I said, okay, terrific. A couple days later, two young FBI agents come up uh, to talk to me, and they said, look, here's what we want you to do. We want you to call them back and we want you to invite him to lunch and try to get him to tell you exactly what information he wants and how much he's willing to pay for it. I said, okay. So I duck called him. Let's have lunch. Oh, let's have lunch. Great, okay. Uh, I said, you want me to wear a wire? They said, no, no, we'll be at the next table. Listen to him. And I said, okay, great. Then they called that morning and said, something else came up. Just do the lunch and write us a memo. I said, all right. So I did the lunch. I write a memo. I got answers to their questions. And then they asked me to do it a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. Each time I would write a memo, send it to the FBI. It wasn't until a year later 
after my arrest that I learned in discovery that there never was any Japanese diplomat. He was an FBI agent, undercover, trying to get me to commit real espionage, trying to get me to accept cash for classified information. But I foiled them because I kept reporting the contact. So they just dropped it. And he told me one day, I'm being transferred to Cairo. I said, oh, that's nice. Yeah, tomorrow, I'm leaving tomorrow. I said, oh, okay, safe travels. Who do I know? But it was the FBI all along. I said to my attorneys, I said, why would they do that? Excuse my language. My lead attorney said, because they have a shit case and they know it. But that didn't stop President Obama's Justice Department from charging me with uh, five felonies, including three counts of espionage. Let me tell you about those espionage counts. First of all, espionage, it's one of the gravest crimes with which an American can be charged. In many cases, it's a death penalty that charge. So, you know, you get charged with espionage. Your first thought is, you know, where's the nearest bridge, right? So, we looked at these espionage charges. Um, I had met with a reporter from the New York Times to talk about the torture program well after everything had been made public. And the reporter said to me, he wanted to do a story about uh, a former colleague of mine who had never ever been undercover. He was an overt employee, he's on LinkedIn, CIA, you know. <laughs> went back to his alma mater to give a speech about why you should join the CIA. So never, ever undercover. He had resigned from the CIA. And he was working for, uh, for these torturers, Mitchell and Jessen. And I said to the reporter, boy, I haven't seen him in years. I, I have no idea where he is. But you know what? I think I have an old business card. So I scanned the business card and I sent it to, uh, to the reporter. And then a colleague of his said, hey, can you send that business card to me too? I said, sure, I sent it to him two felony counts of espionage for sending that business card. In court, my lawyer finally got up and said, Your Honor, we'd like to talk to you about these espionage charges. This is a result of Mr. Kiriakou sending a business card, an unclassified business card, given to him by a former colleague who had never been undercover. The judge says, I find that very hard to believe. So she says to the prosecutor, what say you? And he says, well, your honor, you know, technically it was unclassified, but Mr. Kiriaki should have known better not to talk to the press. I have a constitutional right to freedom of speech. I can speak with whomever I please. So she said she would entertain a motion to dismiss. The other espionage charge was uh, was another conversation with the journalist. Um, <laughs> the Justice Department said that they had declassified the information solely for the purpose of prosecuting me, and the information was, top secret code word information, was that I had told the New York Times that in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, the CIA had a program to kill or capture members of Al-Qaeda. <laughs> I'm serious. Top secret. So we went to court with a copy of Vanity Fair from like three years earlier saying, Your Honor, it's Vanity Fair. Like you have to live in a, under a stone to not know the CIA is trying to kill Bin Laden, right? I hadn't committed espionage. And those charges were dropped. They charged me with making a false statement. I've never really been clear as to exactly what the false statement was supposed to have been. They threw that out too. Um, but the, the point though is not necessarily to send a person to jail, although that's a little cherry on top of the case. The, the point is, especially where it comes to whistleblowers and especially whistleblowers in national security, the point is to ruin you personally, financially, professionally, what they do, and it's really well calculated and well thought out, is they, they do this thing called charge stacking, where they charge you with as many felonies as they can possibly come up with. And they'll let you try to defend yourself for a year. 
and then you go broke. And so they come up to you and they say, listen, we'll dismiss all the charges if you just plead to one. Okay, so they're going to dismiss four of the five counts. So instead of 45 years in prison, which is what they asked for at first, 45 years in prison, I, I couldn't have survived. I'm, I'm 51 years old. I couldn't survive 45 years in prison. I have five children at home. Or 23 months. What do you want to do? You want to roll the dice? I had given my attorneys everything I had, literally. We even sold our furniture at home. I gave them $150,000. Forgive me for flacking a book in the back, but I still owe my lawyers $880,000. And the feds took my pension, which is just standard, you know, in any national security case, they take your pension. 19 years of proud federal service. Anyway. So this is, the, this is the choice. Well, I turned it down. I said they can keep their 23 months. I'm going to go to trial. I didn't do it anymore. It was short-lived. My lawyer called me, and his, act, his exact words were, you stupid son of a bitch, take the deal. His exact words. Another of my 11 attorneys, um, the one who I liked and trusted the most came over to the house that morning and he said, listen, if you were my brother, I would beg you to take this deal. He said, this can be a blip in your life or it can be the defining event of your life. Make it the blip. And so reluctantly, I said, I'll take the deal. Went into court for sentencing in October uh, of 2000. 12, right? 2012. And I stood up at the lectern and the judge said, how do you plead? I said, I'll change my plea to guilty. And she said, uh, did you commit this crime on purpose? And I said, no, I did not. And she said to my attorney, I think you need to have a word with your client. So my attorney says, you have to say you did it on purpose. I said, but I didn't do it. But if you don't say that you did it on purpose, you don't get the deal. And I said, all right, I did it on purpose. And she says, I find you guilty. Sentencing is scheduled for January the 28th. So I went in January 28th and she said, uh, you are not a whistleblower. There are no national security, um, how did she say it? It was something about, in national security, there's no such thing as a whistleblower. There are only leakers. You're a leaker. And she said, you know, it was funny. When I took the plea, she said um, that she thought that the 23 months was, her words, fair and appropriate. And then at the formal sentencing hearing, where the court is jammed with every national security reporter in Washington, she said, if I could give you 10 years, I would give you 10 years. And I thought, well, that's not what you said when the courtroom was empty three months ago. But all right, you can't give me 10 years, so. So I went to prison. Um, I'm gonna tell you one other quick thing about prison. One of my lawyers warned me that the FBI was quite upset that I only ended up with 23 months. Quite upset indeed. And he said, what the FBI does, and they do this in mafia cases all the time, is they're gonna try to put a rat close to you. So don't trust anybody. I was in prison six weeks. And I lived down the hall from an Afghan pharmacist who had an Oxycontin problem and was doing five years. Nice guy. He came up to me and he said, hey, John, there's a new guy. Uh, he wants to meet you. He's the spokesman for the Taliban. I said, I don't want to meet any spokesman for the Taliban. And he said he knows you. I said, are you talking about that idiot from New Jersey who was running around telling all the newspapers he was the spokesman for the Taliban. Yeah, yeah, he's from New Jersey. I said, I don't want to talk to this guy. He said, okay, I'll tell him. A day or two later, I was out on the yard, walking around the big track, and this obviously Afghan guy with a beard down to here is walking toward me like this with his hand out, and I put my hands up instinctively because I thought, the FBI is out here in the woods somewhere with their long distance cameras to say, look at Kiriakou, he's conspiring with the Taliban. 
So I put my hands up and I said, don't touch me. And he said, oh, come on, man, we have so much in common. I said, we have nothing in common. I spent my half my adult life trying to kill people like you. I said, I don't want to talk to you. Come on, don't be like that. I said, get away from me. If you have any idea, any clue what is good for you, you're going to back off. And he sort of backed off. And two days later, he wasn't in prison anymore. <laughs> so after 23 months, I went home. I wrote a series of blogs from prison that I called Letters from Loretto that somehow hit the mainstream and I got millions of, of hits. In fact, uh, Tina, how many, how many letters did I get? 7,000 something letters? I promised myself my first week in prison that if, if somebody took the time to write me out of their busy days, nobody writes letters anymore, but if somebody took the time to write me a letter, I was gonna answer it. And doggone it, I mean, there were some days I was getting 60, 70, 80 letters, but I answered every single one of them. And that's when I realized that I wasn't alone. There were thousands of like-minded Americans, people who respect the Constitution. We're a nation of laws. I mean, either we are or we aren't. There, there's nothing in the middle. We're signatories to the United Nations Convention Against Torture. Indeed, we're the authors of the United Nations Convention Against Torture. We have, a, we have a law in this country called the Federal Torture Act, which specifically bans exactly the techniques that we were using against Al-Qaeda. In 1946, we executed Japanese soldiers for waterboarding American prisoners. In January of 1968, the Washington Post ran a front page photograph of an American soldier waterboarding a North Vietnamese prisoner. The day that that photograph was published, Secretary of Defense McNamara ordered an investigation. The soldier was arrested, he was convicted of torture, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The law didn't change. The, the law is the same. It's the same law we've had on the books since 1946. So why was torture illegal in 1946 and in 1968? But then all of a sudden in 2002, it's not illegal anymore. That's a problem with government. That's a problem when we have leaders who don't respect the Constitution. And that's a problem, frankly, for an organization that has no training whatsoever in ethics. Before I, I close, I wanna, I wanna pose to you a question, and I'm serious about it. I'd like to see a show of hands. This is something I ask um, students when I speak at universities. Let's say that you are a CIA case officer and you have recruited a penetration of a major foreign, uh, foreign terrorist group, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, whatever, it doesn't matter. And you're meeting with this source in a hotel somewhere in the Middle East, and this guy has given you gold since you first recruited him, right? He's given you actionable information. You've saved American lives. You go to the meeting, and he says to you, I've given you everything you wanted. Today, you're gonna to give me something. I'm not gonna give you any more information unless you get me a prostitute, right now. Do you get him the prostitute? How many say yes? Yeah, sure you would. He's a scumbag. Your job is to deal with scumbags. You're gonna keep the guy happy. You get him a prostitute. What if he asks you for a child prostitute? No, no. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not under any circumstances. But there are no rules at the CIA. Look, your job is to violate the rules of the country in which you're assigned. And they don't teach you <laughs> right from wrong. There's just no such training. And there are some people at the CIA, there are many people at the CIA who are so gung-ho to accomplish the mission that they just... Do you think that Dilan was killed? Yeah, I, I do believe Bin Laden was killed. But, you know, the CIA is such a such a such a ridiculously oversecretive organization, um, and this president is so not transparent in any possible way. That I, they, it's like they just couldn't see the idea that people wouldn't believe the official story. I, I, knowing, knowing the people that were involved, yeah, I think they killed him, I think they wrapped him up, I think they said a prayer over him, and they threw him off the side of the ship. 
Uh, but your first question, uh, why was the Bin Laden family allowed to leave on September 12th? Uh, that was very, very controversial inside the building. Um, in fact, most of the members of the Bin Laden family that were in the United States were at Disney World that day uh, in Orlando. And President Bush was the one who made the ultimate decision. He said that he didn't want uh, the Bin Laden family members to be physically attacked, that the Bin Laden family was an honorable uh, family. They had one, uh, one rogue uh, member, one black sheep, and that it was better to just load them all onto a private jet and get them the hell out. And that's what he did. And he's never apologized for it. Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on whistleblowers Edward Snowden and Private Manning? Yeah. That's a, that, that's a little bit of a tough one for me. Well, it, it, it's not, not on Snowden. I, Snowden, there, there's a legal definition of whistleblowing. It's bringing to light any evidence of waste, fraud, abuse, illegality, or threats to the public health or public safety. The, both of them did exactly that. Um, I think Ed Snowden has done the country a great national service. I really do. We would have no idea. We would have no idea that our government is spying on us uh, if Ed Snowden hadn't told us. Now, it, it's even, not only is it illegal for NSA to spy on Americans or U.S. persons, that's anybody in the United States on a green card, it's even a part of NSA's charter. Um, one of my attorneys is a constitutional attorney uh, and a big muckety-muck in the Libertarian Party, Bruce Fine, one of our finest constitutional scholars. And um, Bruce says it's also a violation of uh, posse comitatus. But there are some very serious constitutional issues here that, uh, like I say, we wouldn't have had any idea about if Ed Snowden hadn't told us. Uh, Bradley Manning uh, meets the legal definition of a whistleblower. Um, I think that she went about it in kind of a roundabout way, but what she revealed uh, was war crimes. That's really what it comes down to, is, is war crimes that weren't prosecuted. And so, you know, if, if I had been Bradley Manning, I wouldn't have leaked every, you know, diplomatic cable for the last 18 years, but... That's Hillary's job. That's right. <laughs> I just want you to be a little bit more precise on one point you made. Okay. As you were talking about the, the two waterboarding uh, uh, victims, um, the second one, uh, I forget the name exactly. Oh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Yes. Yeah. And you said that we got almost nothing from that. Yes. And so that would imply we got something. Yes. What Khalid Sheikh Mohammed gave us was um, the command structure of Al-Qaeda cells in Europe. And that allowed us to... Um, to pass the information to liaison services. But again, you know, the FBI has been, has been interrogating prisoners for generations, and they haven't been waterboarding anybody, and they get quality information by establishing a rapport with a prisoner uh, and, uh, and having a, a civil conversation with them. So, so that last part you just said implies that you believe that we would have gotten that intel anyways. Through Absolutely, okay. yes. Absolutely. You know, that, that, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I'll make, I want to make a, a black and white statement here. Torture is wrong under any circumstances. It's not, it's not legal. It's not Christian. And it has no, no uh, place in American policy. I feel very strongly about it. Yes, sir. Um, one of the things that alarmed me when uh, Barack Obama was preparing to take the oath of office was an interview he gave to uh, George Stephanopoulos. And Stephanopoulos, in it, asked him a question about renditions. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, make no mistake about this, under no circumstances will the Army be conducting enhanced interrogations. And I said, anybody who watched it said, what are you talking about? This is the Army at all. This is the, this, the CIA through proxies. That's right. From your knowledge, what sort of, my impression was it's going to continue. Can you perhaps elaborate on that with any information you might have about Obama's administration and proxies? Yeah, I, I, I'm on record as saying that, that I've always believed that the Obama um, intelligence and national security policy is really nothing more than, than a more violent extension of the Bush intelligence and uh, national security policy. Uh, the only difference is that 
Obama has killed way, way more people with drones than Bush ever did. Yeah, yeah. yeah Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize, that's right, that's right. Um, it's my understanding that absolutely nothing has changed with regard to renditions. And not just renditions, but extraordinary renditions. And there's a difference. If, if you're an Egyptian, let's say, and I catch you in Pakistan, and you have no passport, and no plausible explanation for what in the world you're doing in an Al-Qaeda safe house in Pakistan, you're gonna be sent back to Egypt, okay? You're an Egyptian. Um, that's a rendition. But if you're an Egyptian and I catch you and I send you to Morocco or Syria or Libya and don't tell anybody, that's just not legal. It's just not. You know, there's a kind of a famous case, case of Maher Arar, Dr. Maher Arar, a Canadian citizen, right? Maher Arar had flown back to the United States after visiting family in the Middle East. He was at Kennedy Airport. The FBI pulled him off the plane at Kennedy Airport at the gate, turned him over to the CIA, and the CIA sent him to Syria. And he was tortured mercilessly for 18 months. And finally the Syrians came back and said, we think this is the wrong guy. <laughs> And, and I can tell you, and I've said this on Canadian television too, there were many of us in the CIA who were telling our superiors, this is the wrong guy. This guy has a similar name, but this Maher Arar, he's just a professor at some university in Toronto. He sued both the US government and the Canadian government. Like any national security suit against the CIA, it was thrown out on national security grounds because to defend themselves, the CIA would have to reveal classified information. Oh my God, they can't do that. He did win $6 million from the Canadian government. And he said in April, all he really wanted from the American government was an apology. But it's policy that we don't apologize to anybody. We did the same thing to a, to a, a greengrocer in Germany, Khaled al-Masri. Talk about bad luck. Khaled al-Masri. Uh, was a naturalized German of Egyptian origin. He had an argument with his wife one night, and he decided he needed to get out. He got on a bus, and he went to visit his brother in Macedonia. The name Al-Masri in Arabic means the Egyptian. There are about a billion people named Khaled Al-Masri, right? Well, we get word at the CIA that there is somebody named Al-Masri, not even Khaled. There's somebody named Al-Masri who wants to blow up the American embassy in, I forget where, Albania or something. And then we see, oh my God, there's this guy, Khaled Al-Masri, he's on the bus, he's on his way to Albania. So we ask the, whatever government it was, the Serbs or the Macedonians or whomever, stop the bus, get this guy off. We send him to the Middle East. The guy's tortured for almost two years. He comes out of it completely radicalized. Beard down to here, clutching the Quran, death to America. This guy was completely innocent. We were the ones who radicalized him. We were the ones that asked our friends and allies to torture him. That's extraordinary rendition. That should be, it is illegal and it should not be policy. There's a gentleman in the back, yes sir. Why did Barack Obama decide to prosecute you for something that happened? You know, I've struggled with that. The question was, why did Obama prosecute me rather than Bush? I, 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 mean, I mean, rather than Bush prosecute me. Sorry. Sorry. Bush too. I, I've struggled with that. I, I will say, I've, I, I still have some friends at very senior levels at the CIA. I have friends at the White House. Um, I actually have a meeting with the Vice President uh, scheduled in uh, August. Make sure he keeps his hands to himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask him to ask the president to pardon me. I know my chances are pretty much nil, but I, I have to try. But my friends have told me, my friends in these senior positions have told me that it really wasn't the president, it was Eric Holder. That Holder decided to, to, to begin this Nixonian 
uh, war on leaks. And they decided early on not to make any differentiation between leakers and whistleblowers. And so they came after people like Tom Drake. Uh, Tom Drake was here, what, a couple of years ago? Yeah. Tom Drake is an American hero. Yeah. An American hero. But they told him he was going to die in prison. You know, he is still on the FBI's website along with the picture of Bin Laden and, and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Tom Drake as threats to America. Well, it's the Justice Department that's the threat to America. Yeah. So I always believed that it was, it was Eric Holder that was really pushing it. I, I'll tell you a very Washington story too, and then, and then I, I apologize, it's almost nine o'clock, I'll go back to the table. A very Washington story. Um, I was a witness, um, in the Scooter Libby trial. I just happened to be in the room one day when he flipped out like a crazy person. And so I was called to testify. I was CIA officer number four. So, uh, yeah, because I was still undercover at the time. So, um, my attorney was a fellow by the name of Lanny Brewer. Lanny Brewer was Bill Clinton's attorney during the impeachment. Well, fast forward to 2009. 2012, Lanny Brewer's the Assistant Attorney General. And the day of my arrest, Eric Holder calls a press conference. And um, there's Lanny Brewer standing right behind him, announcing my arrest, right? This arch criminal, espionage, espionage charge, 45 years in prison. And I said to my wife, that son of a bitch, Lanny Brewer, look at him standing there behind the Attorney General. I said to my lawyer, isn't that a conflict of interest? My own attorney's prosecuting me? <laughs> I said, well, it's Washington. <laughs> so I get out of prison, and I, a, a good friend of mine uh, and I are talking about my pardon application. And my friend says, you should call Lanny Brewer. I said, Lanny Brewer's not even going to take my call. He said, no, he's a good guy. I said, Rich, he, the guy who oversaw my prosecution. You should call him anyway. So I call him. I still have a cell phone number. I call him. Oh, his secretary says, he's out of the country. I said, well, I'm a former client. I just wanted to say hello, and I have a question for him. Five minutes later, my phone rings. John! I said, Lanny, how are you? John, he says, I want you to know, as soon as I heard they were going after you, I recused myself. I said, bullshit, Lanny. <laughs> I saw the press conference. You're standing right next to the attorney general. Oh, well, that's Washington. <laughs> The last thing I'm going to say, and I, as God is my witness, this is the truth, and you can ask my sister. I live in Arlington, Virginia. My next door neighbors, two uh, Harvard Law School graduates. He is an assistant U.S. attorney in the Justice Department's National Security Division. He was on the prosecution team. My next door neighbor is prosecuting me, right? His wife works for Aiken, Gump, and Strauss and was on my defense team. <laughs> So the night, of the, the night of the day of my arrest, the doorbell rings. I open the doorbell, or I open the door, rather. And he says, John, I'm sorry, no hard feelings. I said, no, nah, it's, it's all right, Matt. I said, I, I get it, we live in Washington. And his wife is standing behind him and she says, this is bullshit, John. We're gonna fight this thing, we're gonna fight it. I said, all right. And we did, we fought it. But that's Washington. It's ugly, it's mean-spirited, it's House of Cards come to life. I can't watch House of Cards. No. I can't, it, because that's Washington. That's Washington. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm gonna send you back. Thank you. Don't say the NHLA never gave you anything. Look underneath the, uh, the, the potted plant in the middle of your table. There's an arrow. The arrow points at the winner of the plant. <laughs> Don't, if all of you win one of the envelopes that's on the table, you can take it and uh, make sure you mark NHLA pack, put your information on. 
life members. This is your this is your last opportunity with this low price for life membership. We need your donations to spread liberty in New Hampshire. Drive safe. Thank you so much, folks.